Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 20, August 2nd through August 8th, 1861. Before we get going, I have a few announcements today. Uh, First is that we do have content now posted on our Patreon, so there is a link in the description. And if you are interested in some extra content, there will be monthly posts on there, hopefully. So this last month, we did do a memoir review. We'll be continuing those memoir reviews and also throw in some movie reviews. I think I'm going to have my first one of those here for the month of August. And it's been a little bit of a hard time trying to figure out exactly what order to put these movies in. There's not really a whole lot that really cover the early parts of the war, so I am going to do a a classic, shall we say. It's called The Jayhawkers, and that obviously, if you've been paying attention, that would be uh, before the war starts, so it is more of a Western, uh, and I'll take a look at that probably first here for August. So if that's something that sounds interesting to you, uh, make sure to check that out on the Patreon. Second announcement, and it might not affect uh, those of us listening right now, but we are on the iHeart app, uh, the iHeart Media app, as we used to be called. Uh, So our podcast is now posted on there. Civil War Weekly can be found uh, through that uh, app as well. So if you have a friend who says, I really like podcasts, and I really like Civil War podcasts, but I can only listen through iHeartMedia, which I guess is in the realm of possibility of things, right? Uh, You can tell them, well, fear not, Civil War Weekly is on that entity now. So uh, you can find us there. Last week, we went ahead and had our aftermath of the first battle of Bull Run and talked about the significance of that engagement. Now George B. McClellan, he is running the show, uh, at least until next September. Robert Toombs also resigned uh, out of the dysfunctional Confederate government as well. So this week, I want to highlight the importance of some technological advances that perhaps we have talked about at least a little bit, Uh, balloons, among other things, and have a little bit of a discussion on income tax as well, so fun stuff. But first, I think it is about time that we had a proper introduction for William Tecumseh Sherman. On August 7th, 1861, William T. Sherman will be promoted to general as a result from his good performance in the first battle of Bull Run. Sherman has been in our story before, having been present during the Camp Jackson affair and actually having to protect his young son from flying bullets at that event. Sherman was born in Lancaster, Ohio in 1820, the son of a member of the Ohio Supreme Court. At nine, William's father would die, forcing the 11 children to be fostered with other families. Sherman would find himself in the care of Senator Thomas Ewing, whose daughter he would eventually marry. Ewing was able to secure for Sherman an appointment to West Point, where he graduated sixth in the class of 1840. Sherman sees some service in Florida during the Seminole Wars, but does not serve in the war with Mexico, as many others had. Sherman is actually in California for the start of the gold rush, and accompanies a mission to determine the existence of the gold. So he actually does have that sort of distinction, being the military representative on that journey uh, in which gold was discovered, which sparked, of course, the gold rush. He would resign his commission in 1853 to go into banking. Banking and then a short-lived law career were both failures for Kump, but he was able to obtain a job as the superintendent at the Louisiana Military Academy, which, of course, is now Louisiana State University. He would resign from that position after being told to receive arms acquired from the federal 
arsenal and then of course deliver them to the state forces but of course sherman will resign before that happens briefly he would work in st louis for a streetcar company before joining the army once again eventually becoming a brigade commander under tyler there is actually a great antidote where mcdowell sees sherman and asks what rank in the army he received sherman will reply colonel and mcdowell would say you should have asked for general you are just as fit for it as i am and sherman would reply i know it so pretty pretty confident of himself there and that gives us a an idea of the type of guy we're dealing with here should be noted that due to thomas ewing sherman would have had political connections that would help him throughout his career he would be off to command troops in kentucky where the wheels would almost fall off the wagon he would suffer a mental breakdown and send erratic messages to Washington, stating that he needed some 200,000 reinforcements sent immediately. This could have been fallout after the First Battle of Manassas. There are many generals who will see that, and they don't want to have to repeat the same failure that McDowell has. They don't want their armies to be destroyed uh, by some sort of mistake, so they're going to be extremely cautious. The press, who Sherman does not like throughout the war, does a good job in portraying him as mentally incompetent. He also does not like railroads, oddly enough, so perhaps that's why he has a field day in Georgia a few years from now. If you can combine the distrust of reporters with several other factors, including a realization that the war would not be over soon, and then the rigors of getting volunteer infantry ready to fight, there's a lot of things that would be weighing on Sherman's mind, of course. He was quoted after First Manassas as saying, Our men are not good soldiers. They brag, but don't perform, complain, sadly, if they don't get everything they want, and a march of a few miles uses them up. There was also unwanted responsibility of a large command in Sherman's volatile temperament, which would be a recipe for disaster. William T., would have a sort of mental breakdown and be relieved, recuperating for a time in Ohio. But he will be back, don't worry. Or, if you are in Georgia, you should worry. In a callback to episode one, you will notice that the middle name of Sherman is Tecumseh, named after the Shawnee chief. It's actually his first name, uh, but when he goes to live with the Ewings, it is not deemed to be a Christian name, so... He has William take over for his first name. Still has Tecumseh as the middle name, though. Uh, sort of as a shout-out to his father, who had, who had died. Because of this, though, his friends would know him as Kump, which is why I've been saying Kump Sherman. On August 5th, 1861, Abraham Lincoln would sign into law the first income tax. Bet you did not know that. Taxation is theft, screamed the libertarians listening. Now income tax, in case you are not aware, is a personal tax taken from citizens for doing work. This tax is then used, hopefully, for public projects. History shows us there has always been some sort of income tax. In ancient times, you would pay with a portion of your goods or crops, for instance. Paying for a war is difficult, so one of the things that Abe goes about doing is making sure that his government will have enough cash. Salmon P. Chase estimated he would need $320 million to finance the war, 300 of which he assumed he could acquire from existing taxes and by borrowing the money, but that still left the other $20 million. This results in the Revenue Act of 1861, which among increasing tariffs, and taxing land will create the first income tax of 3% over $800. The problem, at least in 1861, was that there were not any enforcement measures which would be rectified with the Revenue Act of 1862. Brackets will change throughout the war. In 1862, it would be 3% for 600 to $10,000 and 5% for over 10000 the Revenue Act of 1864 would see these change again, 
to 5% for 600, to 5,000, 7.5% for 5,000 and 10,000, and 10% for above 10,000. Mostly, this would affect the rich, but with the expansion, it would open for more individuals. Well, if we dial back the clock to the 1770s, the colonists were upset about taxes. You know, so upset that they were contemplating revolution. This was met with not too much opposition. Everyone needs to do their part for the war effort. What stuck around after that, and I say for one, look, the war is over now, so we don't really need this income tax thing, right? And it actually went away. In 1872, the income tax was declared unconstitutional. 1909 would see the return of income tax coming into law in 1913 as the 16th Amendment. Bummer. The Confederates also came up with an income tax that was graduated. Anyone below 1000 was exempt, with 1% on the first $1,500 and 2% on any additional income. Let's talk a little bit about technology and its importance during the war. Specifically, let's talk about the telegraph first. In today's day and age, where communication is instant, I think it is difficult to think about if it, that was not an option. Abraham Lincoln would see the advantage of the telegraph as a way to get communications, updates, and give orders in a much shorter amount of time than a courier or rider could travel. Winfield Scott, on the other hand, still attempted to run the war the way he had done in Mexico, a little dated. Lincoln would daily visit the telegraph office in search of news. At the Battle of First Manassas, a forward operating unit was created to telegraph back to Washington with any battlefield updates. This was actually set up by one Andrew Carnegie. And yes, this is the industrial Andrew Carnegie, who would also be in charge of the transportation of troops following the battle. George B. McCon would also see the importance of the telegraph, although he was not as willing to share information. At one point, he tells the telegraph operator that any news he was to receive first. Lincoln would arrive and catch the operator hiding a message under the blotter, but he would not confront McClellan about the matter. Lincoln had a good sense of humor, though, and each time he went back to the office, he would ask the operator if there was nothing under the blotter. This would bring up an interesting point. The telegraph was actually civilian-operated, reporting directly to Edwin Stanton and Abraham Lincoln despite the protest of the military. Part of the problem there was that they do not conform to military discipline, which I can see being an issue if you are drinking on the job or arrive late to work. The United States military telegraph would build thousands of additional lines to aid in the war effort, eventually making some 15,000 miles of new line. 6.5 million messages were sent, which cost $2.6 million. There were approximately 1,200 working as operators and linemen. Some would be captured, wounded, or killed during the battles throughout the war, 175 in total with 25 fatalities. Telegraph superiority would be toward the advantage of the Union and would be the first time it was used for the purposes of war. Before the war, we mentioned most telegraph was located in the North and most operators were Northerners. There were still some 1,400 telegraph offices in the North before the war as compared to a little over 100 in the South. Still, the Confederates did use the telegraph, but not to the extent that the Union would. Messages were even sent in code on occasion, and stymied Confederate codebreakers. It can be argued that the telegraph was probably one of the more successful innovations of the war. But I would like to spend some time today talking about balloons. Balloons had been used to observe enemy troops during the French Revolution, but they were not widely used and quickly abandoned. As mentioned, Abraham Lincoln would be fascinated if there was some sort of technological edge that could give the Union an advantage. Lincoln is the only president to have held a patent 
while in office as well. So he is interested in new things. He would be less receptive as the war progressed, but he would be fascinated with the use of balloons and the works of Thaddeus Sobieski Constantine Lowe. Lowe had been born in New Hampshire in 1832. He attended a lecture by, at that point, well-known professor Reginald Dinkelhoff, the subject of which was lighter-than-air gases. Dinkelhoff was impressed with Lowe, who allowed Thaddeus to accompany him on his tour. Fairly remarkable, considering Lowe had no real formal education. Balloons became something of a great interest to the young man, who would dream of attempting a transatlantic route in one. He attempted a voyage from Cincinnati to Washington, D.C. shortly after Fort Sumter, but was blown off course and landed in South Carolina, where he was briefly detained on the suspension that he was a Yankee spy. An impressed Washington and Lowe would meet with Simon Cameron before Abraham Lincoln. In June of 1861, Thaddeus Lowe would demonstrate his balloon by rising above Washington and communicating to the ground via telegraph. Thus, the Union Balloon Corps was born. Shortly after the Battle of First Manassas, Lowe would rise in a balloon to determine if the Confederates were going to assault the city. From the great height, he is able to see them still in their positions at Manassas. We should note that Lowe was not the only famous aeronaut to be employed by the Union Army. John Wise was another pioneer in the field who was attached to McDowell's army. The use of the balloon might have occurred during the battle, however, it was damaged en route, being caught in a tree, and then lost in the retreat. Wise would not observe in balloons with the Union Army following the failure. John LeMountain would work with our pal Benjamin Butler at Fort Monroe in Virginia. Butler even took a trip in the balloon to observe Confederate positions. LeMountain would be placed under low in the balloon court, but the two would not get along, resulting in LeMountain's dismissal. The first example of naval aerial reconnaissance would be seen with a balloon on the James River when the converted coal barge George Washington Park Custis flew a balloon from its deck. We can say that perhaps this was the first aircraft carrier. George B. McClellan would welcome the use of balloons and they would be used during the Peninsula and Antietam campaigns as well as see some limited further action throughout the war. This is a stark contrast to Winfield Scott, who refused to see Lowe so many times that Abraham Lincoln himself had to escort the aeronaut into the old general's office. Other generals, including the already mentioned Butler, McClellan, John Sedgwick, Joe Hooker, and even George Armstrong Custer, are known to have flown in a balloon during the war. There is a famous incident where Union General Fitz John Porter will rise in a balloon but have the single line holding the device in place snap, sailing him close to the rebel lines before drifting back toward friendlier ground. It should be noted that occasionally shots were taken at balloons, but there is no incident of a balloon being shot down. For one, they would fly too high in the air for small arms fire, and cannon were not able to elevate to take real shots at them. Let's talk a little bit about how balloons worked. I'm no scientist, but generally the gas in a balloon needs to be lighter than the air around it to rise, like, say, hydrogen. In the case of a hot air balloon, heating the air will cause the air, hot air to rise, but in the Civil War there was no real good way to do this. Lowe actually developed a portable hydrogen pump that could fuel the balloons. City gas would be used if the balloon was near a major city with gas lamps. This is where gaslight comes from, by the way. Generally, the balloon would be tethered to the ground, although La Mountain did conduct some free flights during his service. Communication could be done via telegraph line or through signal. They could reach elevations of 1,000 feet in some cases. The Confederates did use balloons, 
but much like the Telegraph, the Union were more in-depth with their utilization of the technology. I know I have been leaning on some E. Alexander Porter, but it just so happens that in his memoirs, he does talk about balloons, so here are his thoughts. We could not get purse hydrogen gas to fill the balloon, and had to use ordinary aluminum gas from the Richmond Gas Works, and we could only use such starting points as we could reach from the gas works without going through woods or very narrow roads. With illuminating gas, the balloon would only lift my weight with about 1,000 feet of line to hold it by. The balloon would leak gas so fast also that it would not keep up at the full height more than three or four hours, and then it would gradually begin to lose and after six or seven hours, it had to be emptied and refilled, which took some hours. For signals, I got up four big black cambric balls stretched over telegraph wire hoops, and I devised a little signal code of one or more of these balls, hung out below the balloon, and copies were given to all the principal officers along our lines. But I was not enamored of my prospective employment. When I was a boy, I had no fear of high places at all, but while at West Point as a cadet, I had a serious fall over a cliff. Porter will go on to mention that he could see someone acquiring the balloon habit, though. Like 1800s thrill-seeking, perhaps. The use of balloons would fizzle out by 1863. Problems with the communications, as well as the resignation of Lowe, would see the balloon core dissolve. Lowe would go on to develop ice makers after the war, which did earn him a pretty penny. I think Alexander does say it best, though, with this quote. The enemy had had balloons in daily use during the whole campaign from the beginning of the siege of Yorktown. In fact, they began to use them during the fall of 1861 before Washington City, and they continued their use up to about May 1863 at which I could not recall seeing them. This would imply that they did not finally consider them of much value. If so, I think their conclusion a decided mistake. I think Porter was a little bit ahead of his time, perhaps. Anyway, I think that that was probably more about balloons than you thought you were going to get today. We talked about some technology today in the telegraph, as well as the balloon, and while they both have their impacts, definitely the telegraph helps to shape the war more than balloons. This week, we had the first income tax in the United States, and we introduced William Tecumseh Sherman to the degree he deserves. Next week, we're heading back to the Trans-Mississippi to discuss the second big battle of the war in Wilson's Creek. If you like what you hear, please make sure to rave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show would be welcomed. Feedback is appreciated. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Questions, comments, concerns, all are welcome. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week. <laughs>